I'm your host, Kaylee, and this is Rebel Wellness. You've just tuned in to Rebel Wellness, the podcast that's here to revolutionize your approach to personal health and well-being. I'm your host, Kaylee, also known as Coach Kales, and I'm thrilled to have you join our Rebel community. In a world that's saturated with fleeting diet trends and unrealistic beauty standards, we believe it's time for serious change. Our mission is simple yet profound, to empower women like you to break free from the confines of today's diet culture and embrace a holistic approach to health that's sustainable for the long haul. If you're like me, you're here to embrace the concept that true well-being encompasses every facet of your life, mind, body, and soul. Rebels believe in aligning our journey with our individual needs and values because a one-size-fits-all approach just simply doesn't cut it anymore. This podcast is your safe space to explore the depths of wellness guided by myself, experts, real life stories, and genuine commitment to your growth. You're here to begin your transformative journey, and it's time to discover your own version of balance in your health. Every week when you tune into Rebel Wellness, we'll learn, grow, and rebel against the polarizing outdated norms to finally achieve lasting vitality and joy because that sounds pretty great, right? Your journey starts now, and I am so excited that you're here. All right, you are in for a treat today. Today is the very first Rebel Wellness interview podcast episode launch. That's such a long word phrase, (laughs) but I am so excited for today's episode for you. It is going to be filled with some really great conversation between like me and one of the most real down to earth, amazing humans in the trainer world from my Portland, Oregon trainer days. And I am so excited for you to meet my guest today. She was also a personal trainer for over a decade. She has seen so many different angles of the training world from kettlebells to barbells to every, like literally everything. She's a very well-rounded personal trainer. And she is kind of one of those few people that actually put the personal in personal trainer, which is why her and I grew so close so easily for a little bit of quick background. I am going to introduce you today to my old colleague and very dear friend, Sasha. She previously owned her personal training private company, You Must Fitness. And Sasha and I first met, I think back in 20. 17, maybe even 2016. I think it's 2017 when I first entered the private training side of the industry. And she was one of the most welcoming people I met at that private training gym. And her and I proceeded to kind of follow each other around because if you are somebody who has any history in the private training industry and you're a contractor, you know just how frequently sometimes those training gyms will close suddenly and then you find yourself looking for another location. And I was just fortunate enough to have not only her friendship, but also her professional relationship. And we were able to kind of navigate those waters together. And we trained at several facilities together and hosted several women's mindset workshops that were amazing. I miss them so much. I wish I could find a way for us to bring them back for you because they were amazing. And we had such great results, such great reviews. Um, I miss those so much. But anyways, I'm not going to go too much further into this, but Sasha and I align so strongly in many ways, especially when it comes to training females and all the different ups and downs and challenges that we face personally, as well as with clients. And this chat, I think is going to be really interesting for you to listen in on because it's not only just about like what trainers go through on the other end. So like you get to kind of see past the smoke and mirrors of the fitness industry with this conversation, at least for our little neck of the woods, but it also, I think will help you feel a little bit more understanding behind what we think, what what we're thinking while we're training you, what we're thinking while we're helping you navigate things, just kind of humanizing this whole situation for you as a listener and somebody who's maybe experiencing it. Maybe you have a trainer, have had it, or you just are observing trainers on social medias and such. And I think it's really important to understand because we're going to talk all about 
body image struggles, pressures, um, interesting angles in the industry that you maybe didn't even know. So there's going to be a lot of really good juicy conversation today. And I hope you can come out of this with a deeper understanding of the real things that we go through, not only as fitness professionals, but that we've witnessed and experienced across the board with our clientele so that maybe it might resonate with you and help you kind of just expand your understanding of this industry in general, because there is just so much smoke and mirrors. And as you guys know, that is my mission to kind of demystify everything for you so that it's just really real human to human, great conversations. But above all of that, it's just a really fantastic conversation with another like-minded human in this health industry zone. And I really hope you love this conversation. Before we get into it, I do want to just invite you to come join our community on Instagram at Coached by Kales is my flagship coaching page. And uh, at Rebel Wellness Podcast is our community that we're building. And if you would like to join our newsletter to kind of be the first to know what's going to come down the pipeline, for further educating yourself or getting more help with your nutrition or health goals or wellness in general, come join the newsletter at coachkales.com. I would love to see your email pop up in there. Join our community. I am not spammy. Trust me on that. (laughs) And I would love to invite you to get into the show notes for this episode if you want kind of all of the little important timestamps for parts of our conversation And there's at the end, a bunch of really great affiliate companies that are resources from me, as well as other ways to connect. So if you just want to go directly to a link, definitely check out the show notes. They're great. And without further ado, I just uh, hope you enjoy this chat. And if you did share it with somebody you think could really benefit from hearing two fitness professionals who with a decade of experience (laughs) chat about all the things. And I also would love for you to rate and review this podcast. So it gets a little more exposure so we can keep spreading the word of taking a spin and being a little more real here in the world. So let's dive right in. And I hope you enjoy this chat. All right, so I have Sasha Brainerd here, one of my all-time favorite colleagues and one of my closest friends. And so welcome to Rebel Wellness, Sasha. Hi, I'm excited to be here. (laughs) So we're going to probably talk on a lot of things today together, Um, all stuff that I'm really hoping that you as a listener will really enjoy seeing a little peek into the background of like being a trainer in the fitness industry versus being a customer or client, et cetera. So with all of that said, Sasha, can you please give everyone a little bit of insight on your backstory with your experience in the fitness industry? Yep. So I started my fitness industry towards the end of college. I was learning that fitness felt a lot different as a young adult out of team sports. And uh, it took a lot more uh, personal motivation and discipline and was a bit stressful, in fact, because there were a lot of other um, things that I needed to commit to as a young adult in college. Uh, So it kind of uh, shifted me towards wanting to provide support for others as well. So that's kind of how I started getting into wanting to be a personal trainer or coach. Soon after that, I got an internship and started to help coach at a Ladies Fitness Express and a Ladies Fitness Express is one of those sort of like round robin exercise uh, modules where you kind of start in one part. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? What was the name that was over down in uh, Multnomah Village? Oh, was there one down there? I forget. It was a, a total type like that. I think a lot of people know what we're talking about. It wasn't like a in shape. It was... Man, no, I forgot that's what that was, but yeah, I think you're. I think you're it's right. like a basically, it's for like females only, dominantly, and it would be like a bunch of machines that like they tell you to just follow the machine route and then you know go. But that's what you're talking about. Yep, uh, and that yeah, so that was pretty helpful in some ways because it mostly taught me how to use machines and help guide people. Uh, it was a very in that way easy um, introduction into personal training. 
but it wasn't very personalized, but it was training. So I kind of got my feet on the ground in that way. Uh, and then from there, I took an internship in Portland, which was a lot more personalized and hands-on. Um, and then trained and trained and trained until 2021 when I didn't train anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then can, can you also, um, when did you graduate college? Like what year was that? Oh, 2008. 2008. Okay, good. It's just kind of good for context so that people can kind of think about like the fitness industry environment, you know, um, back in that time until now, like how it's kind of, it's progressed in some ways, but it's also kind of stayed the same. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And it is um, so many years. Sometimes I forget when I say from 2008 to 2021, I forget that is a chunk. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And um, what can you also like add in a little bit of like, you, so you said you mentioned, or you mentioned rather, you started in kind of big box gym. What was your progression into private training? And like, what's the difference? Yeah. So I, so to clarify your meaning, when I transferred to having my own business? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Like the gyms that you worked at beforehand and then that trans trans. Yeah. Yeah. So working in a big box gym had a very like uniform policy. And I'm not going to say that's how every big box gym works. But in my experience, there's a lot of uniformity and a lot of uh, kind of protocols and scripts that are in place to sort of keep the sales floor running and to keep the inflow of clients coming in. So there is, yeah, that's where I got my first job and my kind of my first perspective on what personal training was. So yeah, I, I guess, kind of like, I think of it sometimes, you know, I walk in, I'm all eager, ready to go. And then uh, kind of right off the bat, I got, I got handed a, a script, like a, a literal script on how to talk to clients. And that script looked a lot like, hi, so your goal is fat loss. And I'm here to help you with that. <laughs> and yeah, I know it's it's like funny in the in a pretty, kind of horrifying way, right? Like, oh, honestly, yeah, it's like... A- what is that? The, the dark humor? Yeah. 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 Because, and, and as it being my first job and stepping back just for a little bit, me having my own off and on struggles with body image, it, it didn't really feel like at that point, something to question, you know? Um, so there's some humble beginnings for me for sure, where I was like, oh, this is, this is the script. This is what you use. And, and so I did. And it's an interesting sort of um, look back sometimes. And I try not to at this point look with shame, but just with like, oh, this is just, this is where, this is where it all started, right? This is where my journey with fitness started. And then in some ways, this is where some of my clients' journey started with fitness too, because I was their first person that they talked to. You learn as a trainer that fat loss is probably most people's goals. And it, it's not, we know that now as coaches, I know you and I both know that that's not everybody's reason for stepping into their fitness journeys, but that's where my big box gym journey started was with a script and with one-on-one orientation sessions with said script and with said client. So then how did that kind of like transition you into wanting to go private? Like, was that an influence or was it more financial or? Yeah, a little bit of of everything. I definitely started feeling a little angsty or I guess we'll use a a little bit like a rebel, a little little rebellious um, towards towards that. Um, I started, I just started taking note that saying those things to people who are like saying a fat loss journey or trying to talk to somebody about um, losing weight when they clearly didn't want to was uh, pretty out of integrity. And their responses showed that. And I felt in my gut that it was not helping or serving others to, to continue being kind of one note in my approach to fitness, because that's not, um, that's not how life works. And that certainly isn't how health and fitness works. There's no one size fits all approach to uh, helping somebody on their journey or getting um, a program designed for somebody else. It's not a template. So yeah, I mean, even within the the box gym setting, I I was starting to make those changes, but I did realize over time that that setting wasn't allowing me to have the freedom to coach clients in the way that I wanted to uh, or felt comfortable doing without some pushback. 
So I moved and shifted into owning my own business and began training in ways that felt more uh, in my integrity and more inclusive to all approaches to fitness um, and really honoring what the client wanted versus what industry standards dictated that the client might want, which was often not right. That's great. And I think that's, I mean, honestly, the same exact thing that I came across um, in my own personal business evolution as well. So it's back when I was private fitness training in person (laughs) alongside you at one point. That's how we met. But yeah, so I think that it's really important for maybe even other trainers, if other people who are in fitness are listening right now, that they understand that there's options if you feel kind of stuck or outside of your integrity, like Sasha was saying, in a corporate gym space. Because like corporate gyms are are very limited by like what is like regulation. And there's so much greater freedom and areas to serve your community if you do decide to take the leap to go private. But at the same time, I think should the listener not be somebody who is in the fitness industry, it's very important to know that there are better uh, or more aligned with what you're looking for trainers that might just be private trainers. They You might have to look a little differently than just going to a 24 hour fitness or an LA fitness or any of those bigger gyms. You might find somebody who aligns better with your health goals outside of a big box gym, which might be kind of new news to somebody. So I kind of thought it was worth mentioning that, especially given your backstory and mine as well. Yeah. I, and I want to echo that. It's uh, really, I think, important to, to be okay hunting around a little bit for the trainer that works for you. How I started in the fitness was, I know what's best for you as a coach, but I think what what gets lost there is actually like a a lot of times the client knows best what what they need in terms of support. We can provide the programming and we can provide the structure, but a client really knows what style of coach will work for them. And so, yeah, just honoring hunting for the right person, the right coach that works for you. And it may not be at a big box gym or it might be, but I think making sure that you have like confidence in finding a person for yourself that works for you. Yeah. And it's exactly why I tell people that personal training is personal. Like it's literally half of the title of that person's job is it should be personal for you. You should be really working with somebody that you feel able to be somewhat vulnerable, if not completely vulnerable, because it's your body, it's your health, and it's a lot of mindset work. And it's very, very, very personal. And if you can't access that with a trainer, you feel like they're not listening to you or whatever, you know, it's like, that's probably not the best fit for you. And there might be somebody out there better who is, and it's always worth like looking for it. So I've always had, I would say maybe like, I've been really fortunate to click with nearly all of my clients over the last decade, but at the same time, there's definitely a big handful that I remember um, mainly through the, like the big box funnel, because like, I didn't really get referred them, you know, like private training, we got referrals. So it's usually somebody who's um, partially vetted by somebody we already train, you know, but, um, when it's, when it's not the right fit, I feel it, they feel it. And I'm like, you look like maybe you might work better with a different trainer, or maybe you might want to go based off of sex. If you feel more confident that like a male body should train a male or something like that, you know, there's, there's people who land in different categories. So I think that really thinking about it being personal and being like, okay with that and <laughs> is important because I know so many people are so like loyal to um I started with this person I must stick with them even though I'm not feeling very great you know what I mean mm. or they might just like walk out on fitness in general like I've totally seen some people be like oh a trainer didn't work for me so I'm not gonna do it you know I'm not gonna do it at all or something did you ever experience something like that I mean a few different versions of that yeah similarly where there was just a, an instant lack of of click right of, of comfort between um, me and a potential client. And that's where having referrals in place, like, oh, I, I know that at some point you've trained some people that either were going to be my clients or were my clients and now are your client, you know, have, having the flexibility to be able to pivot and, and do whatever is in the client's best interest. And uh, yeah, the loyalty aspect as well, too, um, where a client really didn't want to move 
to a different person, but it really was the best move. And then a few months later, they're like, oh my gosh, this is the best fit. Thank you for this recommendation. So yeah, it, it it's hard. It's hard as a, as a trainer to let go uh, too, when you have had such a good connection, but sometimes that is what's best in terms of maybe our times don't match up anymore or a goal that a client has is something that I don't have the specialty to provide. I'm saying this all in present tense, even though I'm no longer coaching, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, you trained. So how long did you train for again? Like, well, whatever the math of 2021 minus 2008 is so 21 minus eight, uh, thir- thir- 13 <laughs> years. Is that, is that math? Correct? I think that's 13 yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> um, quite, a while. quite a while. So just even, currently doing it doesn't make you not uh, an authority in this area yeah. for sure yeah I guess it, I yeah, for for what it's worth when I say current I mean past from here on out <laughs> no it's still it's still I think like past feels like when you've when it's been like a decade since mm, or something yeah. <laughs> my mentality around it um okay so let's kind of transition though into some of the pressures as a trainer, like some of the fitness industry standards that like impacted you, you kind of touched on it a bit in your intro with some of your backstory. That's why it was part of what I really wanted to dive in together because we've had so many private conversations about all of this. But what were some things that come to mind when you started to like navigate that uh, stereotypical pressure in the fitness industry, you know, like the look a certain way, be a certain way, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It really goes hand in hand with, to your point, um, how we're taught to talk to clients in the, or how I was taught in the beginning to talk to clients is how I was sort of taught to think about myself too. Like how, how low is my body? Um, I really, I had potential clients come up to me sometimes and say, you have muscles and I think you probably have abs. So I trust you to train me. Um, and the first time I heard that it, f- it felt good, honestly, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, this is right. And that, that overall over time took a toll on how I looked at my body and how I treated my body because I was, I think the classic term in the training world is, I was a walking billboard for my profession, right? Uh, my body was the selling point. And I am saying that with a lot of air quotes because I don't I don't believe that. So hopefully anyone listening to that's not like, whoa, uh, no, you're wrong. I'm like, yes, I am wrong. I definitely am. But that is, yeah, I feel like Kaylee's face is probably like, Ugh. but <laughs> that that really set the stage. And that's, that's I'm going back to old, my, um, you know, first big box. That's where this happened. I can, you know, remember even on the floor where, where that first time happened, where I was told that. Uh, and it really enforced how I treated my body, um, which was n- no more bread for me and uh, no more uh, really joyful food moments that didn't come with a lot of shame afterwards. So uh, I guess from preamp trigger warning is there's a lot there's a lot there around food and eating right there's there's a lot that took years and in some ways still is taking years to to navigate and heal from but that that was my beginning in in the fitness industry as a coach and how I treated my body yeah if that answers the question it's interesting too because like not even just for females, because like they, they wanted you to have that kind of um, stereotypical lean, muscular, quote unquote, toned uh, body, preferably with abs that were visible. Which, as we know, for females, especially if anyone who's listening has listened to previous podcasts of mine and and whatnot, um, having belly fat is necessary for like healthy hormone production and menstrual cycles, etc. You know, all that kind of balance that a feminine physique actually needs and so getting to that position where you actually have abs showing and such is such a low body fat percentage it's like you have to be kind of really um hardcore and frankly obsessive about your food so it's not surprising that like that bled in for you you know fortunately for me because I came into the industry a little bit later than because I entered in um 2012 which was, I guess, four years after yours, but it was the start of, I feel like a lot more 
people getting a little more well-rounded and like, you don't need abs, like for the female like audience, um, to be fit. Like I started, I remember that was like a, uh, kind of narrative that was starting to get pushed was like, you don't need to have abs to be healthy, you know? So I think I got to avoid a little bit of that a tab, but I also knew that just like my childhood chubbiness, like would never let me have abs <laughs> unless I was like really restrictive and I'm just like love food too much. But, um, it was definitely something where I remember seeing in a lot of the, um, like the big box gym I started at, they were literally training us like in our group training meetings, like the PT director was literally saying like what you said, your body is your um, best sales. If you look fit, people are going to want to train with you because that means you know how to get fit. And I feel like having now been in this for so long and knowing that there's so many nuances that come with that thought process <laughs> is like, woof. like, so let's kind of kind of get into a little bit more of that side of like, how do you feel like you navigated coming out of those really um, hardcore mentalities? Yeah, well, really quickly, I want to expand on on that, too, because, you know, to your point, people were telling me that I looked the part and I must be healthy, but the and externally, I, I let that kind of be true for a bit. But uh, eventually, I had to come to terms with the lie of that, right? It's like, oh, they think that I'm somehow balancing my life in such a way that this is what my body looks like, when in fact, I am really mistreating my body so that my body looks like this. But, but their perspective is, oh, this is achievable with eating uh, X number of calories, like the quote unquote correct number of calories. This is achievable with 30 minute workouts. And I'm like, the truth was it was true in absolutely the opposite, right? It's true with eating far fewer than the, so it, eventually that that is what made me have to assess not even my own health, but, and, and the, my own health, definitely came into play. But a lot of it as a coach was I need to step back and rearrange what I or how I show up because I am walking around kind of lying to people. This is not this is not fair to them. They're thinking this is what a healthy body looks like. And it is for some people, but it is not for me. Mm -hmm. And you mean 30 minute workout, like as in most clients who like pay for 30 minute sessions at big box gyms, like they're showing up to work out with you one or two, maybe three times a week for 30 minutes and, and thinking they can achieve your physique. Is that what you were meaning? Exactly. When I'm working like two hours a day, my workouts are two hours a day, six days a week to maintain this. Yeah. Yeah. So there, thankfully I stepped, stepped into a different health and fitness journey and it, it's not like the smooth transition, right? So many peaks and valleys and returns to uh, really obsessive patterns, but it, it started to look like if you were to look at a graph, this kind of swirly direction towards progress of, of treating my body with, with more respect and more food and more rest and less intense workouts every single day of my life. Absolutely. Which was like completely opposite of what the pressures were and the examples were, I think, especially for us being like young females surrounded by this kind of energy. And honestly, like when we, in the kind of more, uh, I don't know that we call a spiritual world or like the better, better connected to ourselves world where there's masculine and feminine energy that we all possess. You know what I mean? Not to get too much down into that zone, but like the gym is like overly masculine energy, like not mm -hmm. in a way where it's just like get some, but in a way where it is like literally like get some all the time. Um, like ignore the, ignore your energy cues, just keep working harder like uh, work through your problems by just lifting weights, you know, you can cry later or something, you know, <laughs> sweat, sweat is the weakness at exiting your body, you know, all those kind of right sort of toxic, toxic masculine uh, narrative no excuses that you get like, I don't know about you, but like for me, I felt a lot of the pressures of that constantly because it was like, oh, you're a fit chick. Therefore, you're probably more like a dude chick, you know, and mm. therefore you need to embody this hardcore fitness mentality, you know, and I think both of us knew our fair share of people who did that. Absolutely. And it almost in a way where you're dishonoring 
your feminine energy, like the side that we get to bring into fitness that is a little more compassionate and a little more like honor yourself, you know? (laughs) Yeah. 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 What was there another aspect to like navigating that journey with your nutrition and fitness for you personally that you wanted to kind of add in? Yeah. Um, see what more I have to add to that. It really was, like I said before, it was not a straight line from and it still is a you know a line that's continuing forward nonetheless um but it i think became important for me to put less value on other people's observations of my body and to like explain that it's like i i really it became so important for me to have noticeable muscles early in my fitness career and have a a certain look and a certain aesthetic. And it was so affirming when people would point those out that I needed to start to feel that that didn't need to be the case. I didn't need people to point them out. Um, Because what would happen is I would cycle, right? I would get super lean, people would point it out. And then inevitably, I couldn't maintain it because it felt bad to maintain. So I would uh, put on more body fat and you couldn't see those muscles. And so I wouldn't hear that anymore. And I'd be like, oh, I need to hear those words again. So I'm going to, I'm going to get lean again. I'm going to do that. And it was this cycle. And eventually I needed to be okay with people not pointing out my body, not saying, oh, it's clear that you work out and having it be okay to hear people say, oh, are you still working out? Like, those are two different, those are two different things. And really recently, <laughs> I, I ran into someone who asked if I was still working out. And I, I clocked it internally. And I was like, oh, this feels okay today. Like, but not to the point where it feels like I can't even think about it in my head. I'm still in that point where I have to, I have to like talk it out in my head. Like, why does this feel okay? What's going on there? But it's, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but I need to I needed to be okay with not being so visually muscled that I walked around like a walking billboard anymore. I'm not even a trainer anymore and it, it's, you know, still something that I am thinking about today. That's what 13 years in the industry sort of molded for me, but and it's kind of like you unintentionally or maybe previously intentionally helped your value in because I know for me like those pressures were like your value as a trainer for a Mm -hmm. lot of, in a lot of ways, because like, I even remember being at one of the market of choices when I was early in my private training career. And I was, I mean, pretty much my whole career up there. And as you can resonate with, we wear like fit leisure, (laughs) athleisure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, but, um, I was wearing my usual quote unquote uniform and like Nike gear and all that jazz. And this girl behind me was like, can I ask you a question? And I was like, what? And she's like, you're a trainer, aren't you? Cause you're like fit and you're pretty and you know, all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, I am a trainer. And I, I just couldn't like, like the same thing you just said, I had a half mm-hmm. moment where I was like, I felt good about myself. And I was like, yeah, walk in the walk. I look like my occupation. Then the other half of me was like, man, people literally only associate like this aesthetic with like you must be a trainer or something you know and that I remember that because that was like 2016 I remember that kind of was a toxic spiral when I went through like the specific hormonal thing that a lot of my listeners know about where I like unexplainably gained like 25 pounds of fat due to like hormonal imbalance issues you know with all that jazz and uh being like I literally I am a failure like I'm not a trainer anymore physically like I look like I don't know what I'm talking about you know I even remember this like horrible toxic comment a chick uh not a chick well she is a chick but she she is like a she was like 50 in her mid 50s and um she wanted to buy a few sessions with me just to kind of like learn form blah 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 and she made this horribly toxic comment where she was like how 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 do you feel uh, being a trainer when you don't have a thigh gap. I think I had told you about that. Like when it Yeah, happened. we did talk about yeah. that. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I'm like arguably still the same strength or stronger and education internally, mentally, but because like 
my ethnicity partially I've never really had a thigh gap honestly like I have to separate my feet to have a thigh gap (laughs) but at the same time I was like does that equate like thigh gap to you equate like authority in fitness like what you know and so it is really interesting when we're kind of also bombarded with these standards that like aren't accurate or necessary for like your effectiveness or success as a trainer you know but with that said like on the other side for our clients, let's talk a little bit about like the pressures for them expecting like perfectionism being required for their success or as though we are the utmost perfectionism and they have to like match us, even though like you just said, we on our own end, we're not doing everything perfectly. Right. Yeah. I mean, and of course we show up in, in that way where we are um, trying to emulate perfectionism and our, what are our clients going to do if not in some way maybe embody that too. So that's a little bit, uh, you know, our responsibility to to shift how we think about ourselves for, for them not to feel like they have to be perfect either. Um, but having said that, going into how a lot of clients showed up was that way where they also felt like they need to be the perfect client and they need to show up in in such a way where they get perfect results which all of this is again in air quotes because it doesn't exist yeah, no. um, we, we pretend like it exists like it's, it's put up on posters and stuff in the bathrooms like it exists but in reality it's like it doesn't it's not linear that's for sure no yeah the, like those posters like lose 10 pounds in three months or or one month actually three months probably was would be the more realistic gym poster um ugh, but <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> all of this, like all of that, that type of marketing and like Amazon Prime body type energy is like so tough because it just keeps perpetuating all these things that we're talking about, you know? Right. I'm also just reminded this is slightly tangential, but of those like five pound rubber chunks of fake fat that we would have in front of those posters. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, where those would just be sitting there as like a visual. Um, gosh, that's so horrible. I just that just like flashed into my head of how yeah that was a, a real selling point in front of those like lose five pounds in three weeks and here's a what that looks like. Oh gosh, I know. So our- um, like, mm. wouldn't look like that entirely. It's like from every little bit of your body, because then that also goes into the like spot reducing mm-hmm. all these different things that clients would come in and be like, I really need to lose my belly fat, and I only want to do ab work because I want to lose my belly fat. <laughs> I'm like, I wish it worked that way, right? But yeah, so uh, you know, we'd have clients who, when I was doing fat loss goals, I, I kind of shifted out of that towards the end and made it um, different, uh, different goals that I would really um, focus on with clients unless they really wanted fat loss. And I would work with them on that too. Um, but the expectation to lose X number of pounds and X number of months. Um, and even if we decided, you know, not to set a number, they would have done that on their own. Right. So they'd be, they'd be checking their weight every day. Um, and, and being really concerned with why they weren't seeing different numbers show up on the scale look different lower numbers like I thought I'd lose I'd thought I'd lost like seven pounds in three weeks or whatever the number is um and we uh you did this too very much like we both shifted how we talked to clients about what about the non-scale wins what about like how for some people who really were wanting to see different changes in their body which you can what how are how are your clothes fitting how are how is your energy like how are you? How are you sleeping? Let's get away from even mm-hmm. the scale for a second altogether. Like, what is, what is your body telling you? Yeah. Um, like, it's probably telling you some pretty positive things are are happening just from moving. Like, is your flexibility increasing? Are you feeling like you're less prone to injury? Yeah. Uh, all of these different, different, very valid bullet points um, of information. Totally. And it was always interesting to me, like one of the main things, because of all the the band work I always had clients do, they would always be like, oh, this is so great. I have no more hip pain. I have no more knee pain. You know, all these things that are significant, like things that'll chronically debilitate you over time and had been for so many of them. And it was gone, but they could not get over the fact that the scale was moving slowly on their fat. So like, it didn't matter that they were out of literal pain. They just didn't have 
the body fat or the measurement changes they like expected to see like 20 pounds down in a month. Like they thought that that should be the utmost victory and success. And it was like, well, there's a lot more to like movement and health and fitness than just that, you know, that coincides, but you know, it takes a lot more time and intention, but fighting the industry narratives and teaching people the true side of like the fat loss world of how unique and intricate it really is kind of typically made you a little bit less attractive to um, clients who were just like, I'm just going to go for the person who's going to promise me like massive fat loss. You know what I mean? And that kind I of do. Like, yeah. Kind of a, continuing to expand on like the, the client's expectations and like how, how you navigate it. Like how did you navigate conversations with clients when they kept kind of being like, I don't know, I think I want to go with somebody who's more hardcore, or I think I want you to push me harder, you know, not necessarily leaving you, but more so like, I want more, Sasha, give me more, you know? Yeah, it, that is a, such a good question, because there was never and I don't think ever is a perfect response to that. Um, because we're we are being bombarded daily with what the industry tells us it would be a reasonable goal what to expect and you know during i think like what november december you start getting those holiday like new year's resolution commercials coming in so you get all of this like you can do it you can do it so we're getting all this pressure constantly anyways from the entire world on how our body should look so having coming in and having your coach tell you mm, that's not really how it works it feels like, but it is, that's what the whole world has told me. Um, so there's not, it, it is a, it's a hard sell to be like, actually there's, there's a different way to assess your progress and your health. And in fact, it is a much more reliable way to, to assess uh, your, your scale weight will tell you almost the least in terms of health markers uh, to, to how your body is responding to the health and fitness changes that you're making in your life. So I tried to, in as you know, gentle terms, because I don't want anyone to feel like uh, they're, I never want anyone to feel like they're wrong in, in wanting these things. I just tried to say that there are also other ways to look at it. So I never tried to take away that that's what they wanted necessarily. I just tried to give them insight into we can also focus on how your energy is. We can also focus on um, how your pain scale is. And at some point I was coached by a different outfit who provided kind of an informative chart that had scale weight, um, resting heart rate, all these other things. And, and scale weight was like at the very bottom. Like we don't, <laughs> we don't really need to look at this one, but everything else was there. Like sleep quality, there's a place to journal how, your feeling on a day-to-day -day basis and all these other health markers that would allow you to on a weekly basis check in and be like oh actually my stress level went from a perceived seven to a perceived three and that's kind of great like i'm breathing more normally when i'm sitting in my car in traffic isn't that cool I think all these things that moving your body daily can do for you. And it, again, it's not, it's not a sexy sell, but, but there is over time for a lot of people, not for everybody, right? Like not everyone is, is wanting to pursue that at that time when, when I would give them those, those tools. And I totally get that. Um, but there was over time a noticeable change and like, oh, this is really cool that like I get up as my alarm clock is getting up in the morning because I'm like well rested. Cool. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because that's a great way to reground clients like intentionally or unintentionally. I mean, it's intentional for you, but unintentional for them to kind of remember that their health means a lot more than just fat loss. And for females, especially like we're really taught everything matters about you when it's fat loss, like fat loss is your constant goal. Like I've always like, and no matter where you are, what weight you are, it's just like fat loss, fat loss, fat loss, but they never teach us how to rejoice in things that matter more deeply, like your physical being, you know, energy, things that you're saying, as well as like reframing your mind or diverting that attention to 
other things that equally matter or matter more, you know, there's definitely obviously people who will benefit from a body composition change, AKA losing some fat. But when we put the emphasis on the other things, it's almost like, I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of my clients tend to passively lose fat because they start to implement habitual changes that support their non-scale victories, such as better energy, less stress, uh, drinking more water, you know, little things that are actually like truly foundational that are probably what contributed to them getting a little off their health path with their physique. You know what I mean? Yeah, certainly. I, th- I think bodies change one way or another over time. And I think putting less emphasis on that can can yield body change because we're less stressed <laughs> about that. We're not fo- we're not hyper focused on it. And not everyone's body does change with those changes, which is, yeah, like some bodies are the body size that they're going to be. And they're going to see all these other um, health markers like like we keep echoing. We'll say it again, like, right, better sleep, lower stress, all of these things, which will only improve the quality of your life. Totally. And it's in a way too, I guess, the benefit of our position as their coaches and such is maybe we were the first version of a health authority that gave them permission to stop hyper-focusing on fat loss, you know? Yes. I I do love that, especially, uh, you know, having not always been that, that, that coach who provided that permission, but eventually becoming that coach who did that there's a, yeah, that's a very important point. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the evolution of us as a trainer (laughs) trying to be like, what is our healthiest existence and how can I, uh, sneak it into your life so that (laughs) it's almost been kind of a funny like a little mission in the background where I would hear my clients say fat loss goal fat loss goal fat loss goal you know anything in that zone and in my mind I'm like all right how am I going to sneak in conversations where we start to celebrate like all these non-scale victories and then kind of passively encourage them to be like look at all these things that are going so well too you know (laughs) like not in like a bad sneaky way but in just like a way that was like how do I softly encourage you to move away from the hyper focus on fat loss being your value you know what I mean oh I do and yeah I I would do very similar thing I mean no no surprise that a lot of our um like practices were very yeah as coaches very like we did a lot of similar things but I would during con, you know orientations and consultations like listen for other the other things that were being said if fat loss was one of the things I would listen for a moment where it's like I want more energy to keep up with my grandkids or I want um, what you know whatever the other thing was and I I would really ask more questions about that and get curious and and not try to say oh so this is really what you want but but let someone talk more about that and expand more on a, on a different goal, like a different part of their goal. Absolutely. It's kind of like the finding the deeper why, you know, because right. that's always something where once you finally get that out of somebody, once they trust you a little bit more and you get to have more one-on-one conversations with them, um, you start to discover that like, actually it's kind of less about the fat loss. Maybe people feel like um, the only reason they should be coming to a trainer or investing in a trainer is for a fat loss goal. But in reality, it's like, well, what does that fat loss mean to you? What do you think you're going to gain from losing? And can we actually achieve a lot of those things without needing to be so like hardcore focused on seeing the scale move or whatever? Yeah, absolutely. You also just jogged my memory with clients who would come in and say, you know, we'd have our consultation and we talk about, um, just next steps and they'd say, okay, well, I'm going to take a month and do um, this on my own. I want to get, get ready to be fit enough to train with you. Um, and that's just another, another version of, of that perfectionism mindset, right? Where it's like, well, I'm not like at a fitness level where I can even train with you. And I have so much sympathy for that because I, I understand it's like you want to show up a certain way. We all do in any in any version of life. Like today, I wanted to show up as like a perfect podcaster, right? Like, you know, there's there's all these things where we want to show up and, and 
be our best at something we've literally never done before or have only done once, but somehow we need to exude some sort of proficiency in. Um, And so a lot of what I think if anyone's listening to this and thinking about getting a coach, please know that we don't expect you to know how to do all the things or be at any level of fitness. Like yeah. you, can, yeah. you can show up and, and have never done a squat in your life. Uh, and that that's a great starting point. That's fine. Like, um, but that would happen really, con- really consistently, right? Where, and I'm sure you had the same, I think we talked about this many times where, um, people would would leave and and think that they needed to be a, a, you know a little bit more fit before they trained with us and um that just wasn't that's never been the case but it's certainly a version of perfectionism that would show up in in clients a lot which again I get but yeah totally I'd say I didn't get a, t- a too many people that did kind of like a, I need to be fitter till we can work together thing unless they were like thinking that before they finally reached out to me but I totally know what you mean um in in the sense of as well like people forgetting that they're coming to us to teach them to coach them you know to like help them because we're like we're kind of their fitness buddy on the side you mm-hmm. know that they're coming to for like guidance but at the same time, I can see why people would be like, I'm not good enough yet, or uh, I don't know enough yet to work with you because I don't want to either waste your time, seem like an idiot. You know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons of like different um, maybe insecurities that a lot of people might come with, you know, because I mean, the same way that like I've had that with when I started podcasting or any other hobby, uh, bouldering weightlifting, when I started weightlifting, you know, you kind of feel like I don't want to be in the weight section because I'm such a newbie. I'm going to like waste the time that somebody could be using the 15 pound dumbbell, you know, (laughs) like kind of silly things like that. And we kind of forget that, like, come as you are, like you came to learn, you're going to learn more, you're going to come out of this stronger. Like I tell my clients that all the time, like, I'm not here to train you for the rest of your life, despite if you want me to, but uh, I'd rather you gain these skills so you can kind of move forward in life on your own. Now more of a uh, confident person with these skills and understanding your life stuff. Um, And you didn't ever have to be perfect when you started and you don't have to be perfect while you're in it. You know, it's like kind of the concept too of we give them programs and they're like, I've not been following my program. I'm a failure, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, you just really nailed it with the wasting time. I think that was a really big thing with clients and wanting to do stuff on their own first. And then you just jogged my memory on a client would show up really tired from a hard day and be like, oh, well, maybe I should go home. I don't want to waste your time with this session. Um, and that's a whole uh, that's a whole other story, right, too, where industry standard would have you believe that no excuses, push through it, work hard. Um but then as coaches, we can say, oh, you're, well, you're here now. Does, does moving sound good to you? Cause we don't have to do this, this program. Like as is written, we can adapt, we can move. Like you're telling me really good information that you're feeling a little tired today. Like how we can change it up or we can see what happens if we start doing, you know, like there's so many options, but I think a coach giving those options and being really candid, it's like, no, nah, we can just we could do something different. Yeah. And I think uh, there's countless times where intuitively given the week they've had, or um, whenever I check in, like, how's your body feeling? Like we've been getting a beach session, like how much sleep did you get? You know, and uh, bad week, bad sleep, maybe they're starting their cycle. Who knows? I'm like, all right, let's switch you into maybe um, a little bit more lower impact this today. And a lot of times I'll be like, no, I don't want to waste this session. I'm like, well, let's, let's, let's like a uh, backpedal here for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Wasting a session. A session does not only succeed when it is hardcore weightlifting and tons of sweat. You know, that's, it's so hard to also break out of that mentality from the fitness side, not just the fat loss. Like I think I almost had the harder time with a lot of clients just being like, I need to be more hardcore, like work me harder, make me lift heavier, you know, all these kind of things. And there's, you know, of course I'm going to cater to, what you want, but I also have seen what happens when you don't like honor your body and what you need and what you literally just told me that like, you're so tired and you're this or that, you know, it's like, that's not 
saying like a plus b equals c it's like that's like eh, maybe we should subtract b today and you know right yeah we're we're coming in as clients super stressed and then we're asking our coaches to really stress our bodies out more is <laughs> maybe maybe not um the balance that we're striving for. It sounds like it is, right? It's like, just let's get a good workout and that'll feel really good. Like a hard, super hard workout. That'll feel great. But it might, it might not. And speaking of kind of the more stressed being counterproductive for their long-term goals that we're seeing kind of like looking down the trajectory of their um, timeline, I guess, coaching with us, that all or nothing mindset can be like super limiting, I would say, for their success. And it can also be like I've experienced personally, the reason why a lot of people just kind of give up or constantly go on this giant yo-yo, you know, what about you? Like, what have you seen around that all or nothing mindset for your clients in the past? Yeah, certainly. Um, It looks for a lot, it looks for, looked for a lot of clients like, um, this really big list that they would make for themselves where it was working out X number of times a week, eating this much vegetable, doing all of these things. And the the second that one of those things wasn't happening anymore, it was like an F for the week. And if you get enough F, Fs for the week, then what is even the point? And I'm just going to stop doing all of it until I have time to hit all of these bullet points again. No, not realizing that uh, we don't need to grade our weeks for one, but be like, we can, we can have a week where we have less vegetables and we get, we're, we're still able to move our bodies. We can have a week where movement barely got in because you said earlier, like with yourself, life truly gets in the way and we, we can't one workout was what we could do. And that was great, but we get into these all or nothing mindsets where, um, and I used to make these lists for myself, so I, I can speak to personal experience too, but clients would do this where it's like, I did not get this in trainer, <laughs> trainer, Sasha, please help me make sure that I never do this again. And I'm like, Ooh, I can't, I can't do that because we're going to have weeks that look like that. And we should, because we're humans. We're not only of revolving around this list, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but it can feel like that when you're deep into a fitness journey, um, And there's all these societal pressures to make our lives look like this list. And it's so funny that you mentioned the grading thing. I've, I have had clients like ask me for grades and I'm like, I'm going to be that person that's just like, Hey, every week, no matter (laughs) what, you know, like, what am I going to like, be like, be minus, like, I'm not some like hardcore, like, I don't know, you know, like I just, I always thought that was an interesting look into the individual learning styles that must have been imposed on the child version of them. You know what I mean? Like trying to figure out like, where did this come from? Which I would later learn, like as they dived deeper into it with me that, or dove rather, um, that there was so much grading being done on their life by parents. And it like shaped how everything in their life, including working with me as a trainer, was like, you need to grade me or else I have no idea how I'm doing, you know? And it's always so hard to shift those with that mindset into how do you feel like, let's take the power back and give it back to you so you can understand. I'm just here to like literally guide you. I'm I'm not somebody who's trying to like, like it's like me, Mr. Miyagi, like how he's like, I'm not exactly showing you what to do. You have to figure it out and access it for yourself. It's like shifting that power from like giving it to the trainer and giving it back to the client and being like, let's learn you, teach you how to check in on yourself and then communicate with me and be like confident in the way you communicated to me that, hey, I am really exhausted. Let's chill out versus I'm exhausted. I think you want me to work out really hard still though. So let's do what you want, you know? Absolutely. I love the idea of having clients hold a lot of their own power because we are fi- like potentially finite in their life in, in a lot of ways, right? Like eventually they'll be going and doing these things on their own in their own way and what feels good for them. Um, but I think towards the end of my fitness career, and I know currently in yours, we, we get curious and ask our clients these questions, like what, what does, um, a good week of, of fitness look for you given X stress that you're dealing with or given how your week is looking. And then we, 
would work with them based on that. So yes, absolutely. I love, I love a more intuitive training instead of a no excuses training approach, which we've talked about this whole time, but bears repeating that a lot of that is because the client's autonomy is, is key and important and will not only benefit them in the coaching sessions and during the time with it, with coaches, but way into the future to, to allow clients to know what's best for them in the long run. Absolutely. That's also a really interesting transition for us into how did you experience that? Cause you had mentioned before that you kind of um, had that mindset in the beginning of your career. How did that like affect you so that we can kind of make you a real person, not just trainer Sasha? You know? Yeah. I mean, I have a, I have a pretty potent story that um, gets clearer and clearer over time from uh, very, the very beginning of my coaching career. And I'll preface this with saying like, it's a very serious topic. And also I might use some like pop culture to reference how I'm feeling about it as a way to kind of bring clarity to it. So just hold tight while I talk about it. But um, <laughs> there's this moment in my life where I got married. <laughs> so in that moment in time, I was coaching as well. And I was also um, about the leanest I'd ever been. Um, and that came with extreme sacrifice on what I ate and how much I worked out and how much I slept. So again, I say this is a very serious topic because I was uh, not not able to show up in a very sharp way because everything was focused on that. And I think an, an example, like a way that I think of it now is I was basically in the all or nothing mindset to the point where I didn't even care what the consequences were. I, I was like, I'll be this lean. I want my bikini to look like this when I'm in Maui. And that's what I want. Like no one was going to tell me I could train differently than that and show up differently. And I think the pop culture reference comes in because it almost feels like I was like, okay, Ursula, queen of the deep, like take my body fat and I will whatever, like whatever that means. And what wound up happening was I barely remember my honeymoon. I don't, I don't have clear memories. Stephen will, my husband, Stephen will tell me that we went snorkeling and I, I see pictures, but I don't remember that really, which is so scary, right? It's like, oh, that is not how that's not the consequence that I thought was going to show up had I, had I known. So it's, you know, it's like Ariel signing her voice away. She knew, but she didn't really know what that would mean consequence wise. I didn't understand what the consequences were for extreme taking away of food and extreme working out. And that was not something that I even understood after the fact of that right away. There were still years of treating my body in that way. Cause that's back when I was 23 is when I think we got married and I'm 37 now. So like I said earlier, the journey to where I'm now, which is still a journey nonetheless, like it's not a done journey, but it, it took a long time to realize that I didn't have core memories through a lot of my twenties, but it really started right around there where I don't, I don't remember. And I never want to do that again. So when I started talking to clients with that in mind, cause I did start realizing it in my thirties that there were a lot of times in my twenties where I just have some gaps where my brain was working so hard with what I was giving it that it doesn't, it doesn't have memories stored for certain times of my life when I was super lean. So certainly that experience, it wasn't a, like an experience I necessarily shared in a session with somebody. I don't want to super frighten somebody, <laughs> but it certainly colored how I discussed different options of how, how we can navigate goals and what balance looks like, because I don't want anyone to deal with that sort of consequence of being in the all or nothing mindset. Um, it, it's not a, it's not a consequence that, I want anyone to, I don't want other people to not have memories of some of the best moments of their life. Just for physique. Hyper right. Physique. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. I know that that's a side to it that I think is so valuable that whoever's listening right now knows is a potential risk for these things that we kind of just think are 
maybe normalized or ideal, you know, and we don't realize the sacrifices. And oftentimes for my clients, I'll kind of circulate the precision nutrition cost of getting lean chart where it it shows you the cost of getting lean, like not financially, like what you have to give up to achieve that. And it doesn't have on that chart, like memories of your honeymoon or things like that, you know, and and those should be things that people, um, understand the risk and, um, potential cost, because I know even for myself, I, when I was my leanest, um, I mean, I can't even eat ground turkey anymore because of it, because I was so strict on my food and I literally got sick on turkey, not because I was eating so much of it, but because it was like one of the only things I was eating and I still like have the repercussions where I can't eat it. It's really odd, but no, that um, makes sense. It, it also reminded me of the least healthy time for me emotionally, because not only was it not helpful that I was really hyper fixating on my own fitness and food as well, but I, um, was going through one of the worst times of my life with a like really huge breakup. And I was like grasping for control. And uh, it on the outside, when people look at photos from it, like I recently on my Instagram posted a little flashback through the years of my different ages in the twenties, my leanest years were my mentally least healthy years. And people won't know that unless like you and I are saying it right now, you know, and, and if it gets in through their head that like just achieving leanness is its own exhausting event. It's like a full-time job, you know, especially for the female body. Cause we really need to understand our female body, like wants to be healthy and, and balanced and in a good homeostasis that supports all the systems that require a lot of energy, different times of the month, you know, and we don't realize that that doesn't look like crazy lean. That doesn't look like washboard abs. That doesn't look like bony, skinny arms with some muscle that look like look toned enough. You know, um, that doesn't look like a thigh mm-hmm. gap <laughs> for, for most adult females. You know, um, maybe some genetically and naturally look like that, but for the most part, like the way that we represent a healthy female and a fit female is actually one ten-hour period where the model did everything possible to get as dry looking as as they could for a few minutes when they're taking pictures for the cover and then immediately they don't look like that again you know and even telling people that they're just like yeah but like they're still so fit and I'm like but we need to talk about the mental health side to it you know the mental health side of leanness for females specifically is is a whole thing obviously as you just explored yeah absolutely it and you said something earlier about how a lot of people kind of are starting to know what the sacrifices are. And I think that's true. And I think there's still like with the precision nutrition charts and, and kind of resources, but I think it's still important to realize that there's so much that's just not said that they're like, people just don't know the consequences until they get to that all or nothing point, not to just mention that it's not a sustainable method. And there's so much opportunity for, falling into a start stop pattern. Um, but all of the consequences that come with that start stop pattern that are you know, brain fog, forgetfulness, uh, much more serious things than that too. Right. Like, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, it's important. I'm glad we're talking about it. Definitely. Same here. Um, cause I know it's definitely been something that, uh, from the exposure in the industry, even in our smaller local scale, uh, the Portland area or the greater Portland area, as well as um, up and down the West Coast and more, you know, because we traveled down to L.A. and we're exposed to like, what does the fitness look like down there, <laughs> which is a whole different mm. thing. <laughs> but um, trying to exist as as our in our standpoint, what we're just explaining to everybody right now and also simultaneously be around and collaborate with people who haven't really gotten to that um, maybe mindset or something yet, or they don't think the same way, which is absolutely okay. But definitely kind of lets me know as a coach that like this is a mission or a uh, concept that I think is very much worth not necessarily just exposing, but like talking about more vulnerably like we are now so that a lot of people understand that there's so much smoke and mirrors in the fitness industry. And there's definitely a lot of people like us who are trying to change that, but they are still quite honestly stifled by a lot of the 
um, money that the other, like the smoke and mirror side is making for a lot of people, you know? Um, and they could never talk about how they have horrible mental health while simultaneously trying to sell you a 30 pounds in 30 weeks or 30 days, not 30 weeks. That'd be realistic actually. <laughs> 30, <laughs> 30 days, uh, fat loss plan, you know, or all these different weight loss shots now, or they would never talk about their performance enhancing drugs, even though 80% of the women in the fitness uh, competition industry use them, you know, so many things that I think, uh, I really enjoy the way that we approach it in a more like to each is their own, like whatever you want to choose. But I do also think it's important that people understand there is always a cost uh, to getting lean, to, to looking a certain way. And it's deeper than just the physical effects. Yeah, I I think that that's incredibly um and i well i'm just going to honor you for a second <laughs> because i think uh you know towards the end of my my coaching career it was incredibly important to surround myself with like-minded coaches and you being there created the opportunity for me to continue growing in that like get curious about how i want to show up coaching and how i want my clients to feel um and that that is fairly rare still, I think, right? Like uh, not or not rare, I guess, but it's not across the board. So having having you specifically, and and then for coaches to have more generally those other coaches around them to expand what coaching can look like is really awesome. You know, we had those great like set. We would both end a session with one of our clients, and we we would talk a little bit about how our sessions are going or how things are going, or we'd have questions like, Hey, what do you think about this approach for this client? And, and we having so having, having that was, was, and I think is for coaches. So magical for growth. Yeah, totally. I think that um, I, I, that was easily the best like golden age part of our training careers. I think is having that container to get to work alongside each other, but individually, but also still get to collaborate. Um, and I do know so many people had no idea that we were about to start a gym together, like right in the beginning of the pandemic. I'll just put a little blurb in there for anybody who is listening that uh, knew us from the uh, Oregon days up. up. <laughs> and it was, I mean, yeah, the universe has its own uh, pattern for us and, and uh, path. However, um, I think that that was the thing that really made it easy for us to say like yes to trying to cultivate a um, environment that continues that concept for people because we both know down to our souls that like that is ultimately what really truly matters with um, at least in our kind of more niche of um, gen pop females, you know? Um, but at the same time, I think for all humans, honestly, it's important for us to give grace on our journeys, understand that you don't need to be perfect or look a certain way to be valuable to yourself and to the community you're in and your family and, you know, all those different things. Like I think, um, as we close out this chat together, um, it's just really important to understand that all these things are not just something that only our clients experience. Like, I hope that everyone listening kind of understands that this is something that we struggled with as trainers for the last like over a decade for both of us, you know, Um, and there's, we're all like real humans. Like we all have a way that we absorb the way that society um, exemplifies a super fit body and what does it look like to be fit and the quote unquote that girl or whatever. And in reality, how do we mold that into a healthier uh, worldview and mindset for health for long term? Because that's, I know my goal and that was always your goal with a lot of your clientele um, back when you trained as well. Yes. Um, I want to say one thing really fast, but in an alternate universe, I truly believe we own a gym and are crushing it (laughs) (laughs) in another world that is definitely happening. And I I see it super clearly, Mm. but yes, what, what you're saying is is absolutely true. I think, um, there's, there's a version of, of, uh, coaching where a client can come in and either a have, have fun with it or if fun isn't their goal, because it doesn't have to be, at least it's not, a yucky time for them, right? They're not, they're not like actively disliking the process. And I think that 
we've talked about super serious stuff for a lot of this podcast and I, want, I just want to circle back and like the whole point is to to be curious and to to see what the, what the client wants and and I think that that's what that's what you're doing and that's what a lot of people are doing in the industry and the more we talk about it the the more it gets spoken and acted into existence totally yeah absolutely it is a whole journey for not just not just the client it's a journey for the coach as well <laughs> Mm-hmm. even individually, like the things that clients have taught me about myself or my own mindsets or, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think it's definitely valuable. Yes. <laughs> all right, lady. Well, I super appreciate you taking the time out to chat about all this. I know there was some definitely uh, good, vulnerable, deep conversations we had, but I really, truly appreciate you taking the time to share your story with my podcast listeners. And, um, I, before I completely close out, I am going to ask you one specific question, of course, that um, I, whatever way you want to respond to it, mm. go for it. Okay. So the question is, what does it mean to you to be a wellness rebel? It's a little bit about what we've already talked about, but um, yeah. So what really it means to me to be a wellness rebel is to in the wellness world and really across the board in every facet of my life, but specifically in the wellness world to stay curious, specifically if something I hear doesn't feel right in my guts, you know, to question it and to um, figure out a, a way where it can align more with my values. Um, if, if I like specifically in my, in my head, so in my own head, if I, if I hear myself speaking, negatively either about myself or about or about someone else and to really stop myself in my tracks and and to be like why am I why am I going down this path what can what can I say differently about myself or how can I treat somebody else with more empathy um in that moment uh so that yeah just just being more curious and and less stuck I think just like rebelling against the wellness stereotypes and like mm -hmm. mentally, like challenging yeah. like why did this thought pattern just come up and is it true <laughs> yes is it true probably not <laughs> but what is it trying to tell me <laughs> um and then uh, to that end so, um continuing to move exponentially closer to aligning with my values uh, which means checking in with them often and knowing that integrity is really paramount so if something feels out of integrity it more and more will speak to me pretty quickly. Like, Ooh, that wasn't it. Uh, well, let's do better. Uh, let's move closer. Um, and realizing that it's my whole life where, which is a rebellious thought. Cause I'm an instant gratification girl. I want, I want, <laughs> I want to be, um, I want to be okay now, but, or I want to be X now, whatever that is. But knowing that as a, uh, a rebel of, of myself sometimes like, no, I'm going to have to keep working on this and, and get, to a better place and then from there to another better place and continue exponentially increasing all the way until I'm old. Absolutely. No, that's awesome. And I think that the concept you just said is really rings true that it's a constant journey of battling thoughts like this and knowing that you're never going to arrive at your best self and maintain it forever. Like, I think that's also a kind of absolutism mentality that completely is not necessary and and is um great that you pointed that out that you're constantly having to be like i thought i'm further than this why did i just have this thought you know because I, I get through that all the time too like oh i was in my best fitness and then i got sick or i went on a vacation and then i got too sore and so it messed up my workout routine and now i'm not perfect anymore and i just need to get back to that and it's in reality it's like you're just constantly moving forward like whether it's in your fitness or your nutrition or your mentalities or your narratives you're trying to unwrite, you know, it's like, there's always going to be a little back and forth, but that doesn't mean that you're constantly going backwards, you know, like everything that you're mindful of and that you're aware of is, is more positive than when you never were, you know? Yep, exactly. But I think that's, I think that might be the best way to describe a rebel in wellness, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just being like, whatever we are taught is probably not the uh, best way to go about it anymore. Yep. 
All right, so that concludes our chat. And again, I want to say thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. It was an absolute pleasure as always. And this is probably not going to be the last that you hear of Sasha. So thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you for having me. This has been really great. Um, And I just love you so much. still listening thank you for tuning in to our latest episode of rebel wellness if you've been enjoying our conversations around health fitness and wellness i have some exciting news for you so if you would love to join our newsletter group you can join us on coachkales.com or you can join my stan store at stan.store backslash kales k-a-i-l-e-s and that's an awesome opportunity for you to snag some freebies that i've created including a macro hack grocery list that is going to help you kind of design a custom grocery list specially for following macronutrients because as you know if you didn't listen to my macros in may series i would go back to those episodes because it has been a game changer for so many of our listeners for getting more on top of how to shape their physique and their health goals with the food they're eating. So don't sleep on that. Go get your free download, stand.store backslash kales. And you can also join our newsletter from that. And if you would like to reach out to me, chat, maybe work together, you can also contact me through my website, coachkales.com. And I would absolutely love you to join our rebel wellness podcast instagram which is at rebel wellness podcast and you can also join my flagship coaching page at coach by kales that's where it all began that's where i share the most um kind of custom to what i work on specifically with my clients on that page. So join that one. It's all feminine wellness focused. And I share some great stuff, some goofy stuff, things that you just don't want to miss as well as healthy recipes and things and easy recipes because we all kind of need some easy grab and go things, don't we? So I would love you to join both those pages as you'll be joining a community of like-minded females who are all committed to living their best lives. So hit that follow button. And I would love if you felt the need to share and rate our podcast. We would love that. Anyways, thanks for listening. And I hope to catch you next Sunday or say hello on the gram.